So today we're going to be exposing some radical predictions made by a 1997 book that not only predicted Bitcoin over a decade before it was even created, but this mystery book also predicted the rise of smartphones, video calls via platforms like Zoom, and they even predicted the rise of digital nomads, which is the fastest growing trend today. So of course, we're talking about the book, The Sovereign Individual, and not only does this book have some prophetic predictions about the future? But I believe it is the most actionable book I have ever read. It tells you how to survive and thrive in this digital transition that we're actually living through today. And it was the one book that tipped me over the edge in leaving my home country of Australia over two years ago and traveling the world. So let's start breaking down how this book was so accurate with its predictions and explain some of its predictions for the future. And it is all based on a simple premise that technology changes everything. So not only do the authors say that technology changes everything, but the authors make the claim that technology is the thing that has actually pushed our society through four major stages of existence, okay? This is the blueprint for how we actually went from living in farms and villages only 200 years ago to living in these mega sophisticated, technologically advanced societies we find ourselves in today. Nobody can explain it better than this book can. So the book claims that the first major pivot point or stepping stone that brought us to where we are today happened in the agricultural revolution around 10,000 years ago, okay? They say that this transitioned us, our species, from being a hunter and a gatherer species to an agricultural species, living in these agricultural societies. And this, for the first time, changed everything because it gave us the ability to actually create savings and have excess in the form of grains, wheat, rice, before we settled down in these agricultural societies, we were hunters and gatherers. We were very mobile. We moved a lot. There were no need for a large government to come and actually protect our excess or protect our savings until we did transition into agricultural societies. So that was the first big transition point that the authors say actually changed human history. The second came around 10,000 years later. And that was through the, once again, technological revolution. That was the industrial revolution in the 1770s. This brought us out of living in farms and villages into living in these massive, big, centralized mega cities. Think about London, New York, Los Angeles, all these massive cities where the people moved and started living in these big factories to work in all of these machine lines. And since then, just think about how rapid technological advancement has come, okay? In the 1770s, we were literally traveling around in horses and carriages. But today, we've seen the world change so rapidly. Now, this acceleration we've seen in technology is a core premise of the book. They say that now, after 250 years of living in these large industrial scale societies, for the first time in history, we are actually going to live through a technological revolution that is going to decentralize the world. And that book says that we are transitioning in something called information society. So in this world, the authors say that technology is now actually going to enable these digital nomads all around the world to escape from these large city centers that we've been centralized into. And they're going to actually perform their economic activity from wherever they want all around the world. So the authors Authors say that the advent of cyber cash, digital money, which of course is Bitcoin, as well as things such as encryption and the internet, all of a sudden are going to absolutely change the workspace. And it is going to once again, change the role of governments and change incentives in our society. So we're going to talk a little bit more about their prediction of cyber cash and how it's actually going to shrink the nation state a little bit later on into today's video. But I want to talk about this acceleration that we've seen in these three prior technological revolutions the book is talking about. So I'm going to read a quote from the book directly. It says, the growing importance of technology in shaping the logic of violence has led to an acceleration of history, leaving each successive transition with less adaptive time than ever before. So they say that even if the first farmers had miraculously understood the full mega political implications of the agricultural revolution 10,000 years ago, 
this information would have been practically useless because thousands of years were to pass before the new transition to the news phase of society was complete. Not so today. History has sped up and with events unfolding many times faster than during previous transitions, early understanding of how the world will change could turn out to be far more useful to you than it would have been to your ancestors at an equivalent juncture in the past. So the book is saying, look, you learn how to use the technology that is changing our world today, and it is going to benefit you in absolutely profound ways. And because they believe technology changes everything, one of their very core premises of the book is the prediction that the microprocessor is going to shrink the nation state. So what exactly does that mean? Well, all of these technologies that are freedom enabling, like cyber cash and encryption, and the internet and peer-to-peer -peer communication, all of those are built upon the foundation of the microprocessor. And they believe that it is these technologies that is going to shrink the nation state in a very similar way to how the technologies built off the printing press in the 1500s actually shrank the church and the state's monopoly on information. They believe that we're living through a very similar thing today, and it is going to once again again, shrink the power dynamic of those who are controlling the information and the money today. So that's the first takeaway for the book today. The microprocessor is going to shrink the nation state. The second big takeaway is the fact that this information revolution is going to happen far quicker than other ones. That's your second big takeaway for today. Something else that's very important that they talk about in the book is this thing called mega politics. They claim that things like technology, as well as other things like the climate, topography, and microbes play a far bigger important role of shaping history than your typical politics actually do. They list a number of great examples in the book of why this is the case. I would encourage you to read the whole book, but I want to read this quick quote here because I think it encapsulates their point nicely about politics becoming less important on the other side of this information society transition we're living in. The readers reared in a century saturated in politics. The idea that life could proceed without it may seem fanciful, but we believe it will end the modern world just as the tangle of feudal duties and obligations that engrossed the attentions of people in the Middle Ages ended with the Middle Ages. So they believe that technology is going to once again bring about the end of politics. And they really bring the technological receipts to back up many of their points. They go into detail explaining how very small technological inventions like the stirrup completely changes everything and it changes the logic of violence. They highlight that once that was invented, all of a sudden a knight could actually sit on the back of a horse in a more secure fashion. And this led to the domination of knights. They were able to literally fight off 40 or 50 peasants sitting comfortably on the back of a horse all because of this very small invention of a stirrup. But then obviously the invention of gunpowder a couple of hundred years later once again changed the logic of violence because all of a sudden a peasant with a gun could simply shoot a knight. And the book makes many very fascinating examples of how technology changes everything. And obviously one of the biggest things that they point to is how the printing press changed the size of the nation state. They make many analogies of, of how the printing press absolutely destroyed the power held by the church and the state in the 1500s. Now, this is the biggest analogy that they draw to in the book. They wrote a whole chapter detailing the collapse of the church and the state and how the printing press did it. And they dedicated a whole chapter to looking at this example because they believe that this is exactly what's going to happen to the nation state because of the microprocessor today. So while we're talking about mega politics, it's important to note that the authors believe that how violent history is, is dependent upon the incentives at the time, which is largely shaped by these mega politics or the technology, okay? Why was feudalism so violent in the Middle Ages? Well, it was because of the technology available at the time. If somebody could be a well-trained knight and essentially get on the back of a horse and pillage a village with 50 peasants who 
who were untrained on the back of a knight, they would do that. And that's why it was so violent then. And the same is true for the past 500 years of history. The authors believe that we are leaving one of the most violent times in history and transitioning into a world with less violence. So again, they believe that the size of the nation state has been dependent upon the technology we've seen over the past 500 years. It's very simple. If you can build a larger army or build bigger and better bombs, what you do is you just go and drop those bombs on a Middle Eastern country and you take all of their natural resources. That's essentially the world we've been living under for the past 100 years. Even think about things like Hitler's rise in the 1930s. He would just simply invade a country and take somebody's gold because it was so easy to steal a whole nation's life savings, gold, when it was just sitting there in a stationary bank, easy to steal. We're going to talk a little bit more about how money has changed with this emergence of what the authors of the book called cyber cash a little bit later on when we dive into their whole chapter dedicated to Bitcoin and cyber cash at the end of today's video. But before we talk about Bitcoin a little bit later on into today's video, I wanted to remind you guys that you can get yourself $10 of free Bitcoin if you sign up with Swan Bitcoin. You can check them out at the link down below in the description of today's video. And they're going to give you guys $10 of free Bitcoin just for signing up. So if you haven't already found a place for you to set up a weekly DCA to get rid of your fiat as soon as you get paid, definitely check out Swan Bitcoin at the link in the description of today's show. But let's summarize what we've learned so far, okay? The sovereign individual thesis is that technology changes everything. But what comes next? Are nation states just going to willingly hand over their power to these sovereign individuals? How does this battle play out? Let's dive a little bit deeper and talk about how this transition into information societies might be one of the most radical transitions that we've gone through as a civilization. So I want to quickly read one quote from the book that I think is pretty telling. It says, cyberspace is the ultimate offshore jurisdiction, an economy with no taxes, Bermuda in the sky with diamonds. When this greatest tax haven of them all is fully open for business, all funds will essentially be offshore funds at the discretion of their owner. This will have cascading consequences. The state has grown used to treating its taxpayers as a farmer treats his cows, keeping them in a field to be milked. Soon those cows will have wings. And he's obviously talking about the ability for people to actually use this thing that they called cyber cash to put their money in an offshore jurisdiction away from their nation states. And this is what we're beginning to watch unfold today. The book also predicted that some nations would actually recognize this trend of digital technology and they would begin to start competing for the capital of these sovereign individuals. Think about El Salvador welcoming businesses from all around the world to come and start a business in the country and pay zero taxes. We're watching this pop up all around the world. You've got countries like Panama and many, many, many others who are trying to attract the business of these sovereign individuals who are slowly beginning to learn that you don't need to work in the borders of a tyrannical Western nation state who's going to take 60% of your money in the form of tax taxes and not even do their job. A government's sole role is supposed to be protect you, protect your capital and clean up crime. It's as simple as that. But in states like California and countries like Australia and New Zealand, the governments are no longer interested in actually looking after people. They're only interested in strip mining our wealth. And this is why you're beginning to watch a very, very rapid trend of interstate migration in America. So people are fleeing these states like New York and California at absolutely record rates. And they're going to states like Florida and Texas who have much lower rates much smaller governments. And this is not only happening on a domestic level in America, this is happening worldwide. We can see from this chart here that the trend of digital nomads is one of the fastest growing trends for the past four years, okay? It's keeping up with Bitcoin. We can see it's growing by around 40 to 50% every single year. And today there's over 35 million digital nomads all around the world. And just as the demand for friendly nation states only rises every single year, 
as Western citizens have enough of their tyrannical governments, we can actually see that the supply of governments and nation states around the world opening their borders to these sovereign individuals is actually opening. Of course, we have the infamous case of El Salvador becoming the first country to make Bitcoin legal tender and completely deregulating itself from a business standpoint. If you didn't know, you can go to El Salvador and start a business for 0% tax which of course is a very attractive proposition for many of these sovereign individuals. And then more recently, Argentina has just elected their first libertarian president, Javier Millet, who also happens to be a pro-Bitcoin president. So if you are somebody in the West who potentially wants to become a sovereign individual and you want to learn a little bit more about these nation states that are opening up their borders to the world, we did film a recent documentary of my time in Argentina. I'm still filming in Argentina right now, but if you want to learn a little bit more about Bitcoin adoption and what the 252% inflation in Argentina looks like, you guys can check out the video we recorded on that topic. I'll pop a link to it right there. And if you want to learn a little bit more about El Salvador, I did film my full six month journey in El Salvador. You can find a link to that video right there. And with all that said, hope you enjoyed this video breaking down what the sovereign individual is. Let me know in the comments down below what book you want us to cover next, and I'll see you all in the next one.